It's Tuesday, August 19th. Welcome to Market Foolery. I'm Chris Hill. Joining me in studio today from Motley Fool Income Investor, James Early. Thanks for being here. Anytime, Chris. It is my pleasure. See, as I promised listeners last Thursday, I said we're going to have, have a couple of special guests this week, people who are not normally on the Market Foolery, and, uh, and James is one of them. Because if you listen to our weekly radio show, you know James is our expert when it comes to dividend investing. And I wanted to talk about dividends because we don't, we don't really dig into that uh, in the way that we do sometimes on the radio show. Um, first, what is it about dividend investing that, that attracts you? You're a smart guy. You, you could, it's not that other types of investing are out of your mental grasp, but this is something you're interested in. This is something you gravitate towards. Why is that? Yeah, Chris, to me, you know, I'm, I'm not a very emotional guy. I'm, I'm just kind of this, this boring uh, engineer type of person. And, and that's why dividend investing appeals to me, because academic studies show that it outperforms. In other words, I don't have to try really hard each month. To f- I mean, I do try really hard to find the, the best stock, but I'm working with a statistical advantage off the bat. I could be blind and throwing darts at a, a, a page of dividend stocks, and I'm still statistically likely to beat the S&P, which I love. I love cheating in that way. <laughs> it's legalized cheating. Legalized cheating. Why is it that, or why do you think it is that dividend stocks, on average, outperform? I, I think it's because growth stocks, on average, don't outperform. In other words... The ones that do... Outperform magically, yeah, yeah. wonderfully. The, the histogram of growth charts, will, growth stocks, will, you'll see like one great big winner for for many, many, many losers. Like in the U.S. in the what's the 1930s, we had 200 and something auto companies, and and now we've got what just a handful of them. That works for technology. That works for just about any new industry. So everyone is so excited about that. They all hope that they've found the one big winner, and that basically leaves boring little uh, or boring big dividend stocks uh, somewhat underfollowed and underappreciated. And that's why they tend to do better as they actually deliver better cash flows than investors expect. I'm not asking you to reveal everything about your process, but what's when you are looking for dividend stocks for the service that you run, what, what are a couple of the things that you do to find them? I have a process, Chris, that I, that I want to have work the same every month, whether I'm drunk, exhausted, sick, and, and I, don't, I don't even drink, but, but that's, the, that's the idea. I, I want something that's airtight. So, so I, I usually do screening. If you tell me that a company has a return on equity above 12%, it has long-term management, uh, with if it's a small company, with material inside ownership in the business, that it has a number one or a number two share in its market, that it's been growing its dividend in the past couple of years, I won't necessarily... Love that business off the bat, but I will be a lot closer to liking it. And after I do that, I'm going to d- dive into to a smaller number of, of recommendations and, and do full-blown valuations, which is pretty time-consuming, not something you could do with every stock. But basically, I whittle it down uh, in, in a way kind of like that. How important is longevity in dividend-paying uh, for a company? How important is that to you? Because I know that, in general... One of the things you like to see is, hey, this is a company that's been paying a dividend for 20 years. In some cases, it's a, we've talked about companies that have increased their dividend year over year for 20 years or more. Uh, is is that automatically a? Uh, I don't want to say automatically a plus, but how important is that to you when you're making a decision? Here's what you need to know about Chris. There's a great divide between U.S. dividend stocks and non-U.S. dividend stocks. In the U.S., the dividend is looked at almost like a bond. So companies want to keep paying that dividend. If a company has a long history of paying a dividend, they typically advertise that in some way on their investor relations page. They're proud of that, and they don't want to cut that dividend. So yes, a company with a long history of keeping its dividend, or ideally raising it a little bit each time, is that company is going to resist strongly cutting its dividend. Now, overseas, companies do something very different. They tend to pay out dividends as a percentage of their earnings. So a company pays out, let's say, 40% of its earnings. If the earnings are high, they pay out a higher dividend. If the earnings are low, they pay out a lower dividend. Those guys you know, don't really, I don't say they don't care, but that's just their policy. It's actually healthier for the company because the variability is passed on to you as the investor, whereas in the U.S., the companies assume that risk. So if the company does have a long history, they're not going to want to cut it. All right, let's get specific. What are a couple of companies that over time have proven to be not just solid companies, but steady dividend payers. That if if someone is listening and they're thinking, you know what, I I, I could use a, a dividend stock in my portfolio. Well, 
I'll, I'll answer this question in a guarded way because with I, I'm not looking for just out and out okay, recommendations, yeah. but oh, just long term dividend pairs. Yeah, you can, you can Google something S and P dividend aristocrats. You'll see AT and T aristocrats dividend aristocrats. It's like a real name, <laughs> dividend aristocrats. That index. sounds like a club. These are are companies that have increased their dividend payouts for the past 25 years. So companies are very proud to be a, a dividend. I mean, who wouldn't want to be an aristocrat? AT and T, Colgate. Uh, Illinois Tool, Tool Works, this is a kind of a boring, unloved company that's better than most people think. Uh, Cisco, not the Cisco routers, the, the food service Cisco. Uh, 3M, uh, there are, let's see how many lines, 51 com- Walgreens, uh, Walmart, uh, you know, P- you know, uh, Pepsi. Now, these are not all Johnson & Johnson, of course. These are not all necessarily the best investments right now. They're, I, they're basically all solid companies, but people have piled into dividend some of these the bigger name dividend stocks right now because they're they're a little bit afraid of some of the risk in the markets and so the the blue chip type names the J&Js the Pepsis uh those are are often a little bit pricey as of this taping when a company raises their dividend and typically we see that around an earnings announcement and it's oh by, by the way here are our earnings and we're on top of that we're raising our dividend that sort of thing is that always a good thing? I mean, it, 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 on the surface, it seems like if you're a shareholder or a prospective shareholder, yeah, it, I'm getting a higher payout, so it is automatically a good thing. But but uh, you're someone who studies this for a living. Are there ever times where you look at a company raising their dividend and you say, I, I don't know about that? Ninety-something percent of the time, it is a good thing. Uh, Ned Davis did a study showing that dividend growers and initiators from, I want to say, 1986 to uh, 2012 uh, rose 9.6% a year compared to 1.7% uh, for companies that, that, that paid no dividends. So it's a, and there, there are actually a number of other studies that show that companies that raise their dividends outperform. Now, occasionally, you'll get the imposter. The imposter company knows that, that so many investors see these studies and they're looking for dividend stocks that are going to raise their dividends. So they try to, to approximate kind of like those animals in the animal kingdom that, that, that masquerade as somebody else. They try to approximate a, a healthy dividend company by taking on a lot of debt or paying out uh, money that they, they can't really afford just to technically raise their dividend, often by some small amount. Another thing you'll see is a company that delivers a, a so-so results but wants to have something good in the headline, in the press release. So they'll raise their dividend by like point oh 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 one cents just to say they raise their dividend. But that's kind of cheesy. Uh, is it... It, it, based on your description that you just gave, it, it makes me think of smaller companies, businesses that maybe are not as stable. Is that always the case, or are there ever examples where there's a big, maybe consumer-facing, well-known company that's raising their dividend? And you're you're looking at it saying, I, "I think this is a mistake," or "I think," I, or "I know why you're doing this, and this doesn't. You're not going to get as much credit from me as if." for the umpteenth year in a row, ExxonMobil is increasing their dividend. The big companies, the, the last one I could think of was Procter & Gamble that did this. Now, they just, you know, they've had a, a lot of bad headlines in the past, let's say, two or three years. They've really just underperformed. And 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 they're guilty of, of raising their dividend by the very small amount. They're not guilty of paying out some unsustainable yield to try to bait investors. That does tend to be smaller companies. Big investors, uh, the big companies know that, that, that people will catch them on that uh, more, more easily. Uh, I know we're past the halfway point of 2014, but I'm curious as someone who studies not just dividend-paying stocks but is interested in the market in general, what are you watching as we start to wrap up the sem- summer and we're heading into the fall? It seems like in terms of either businesses or industries, there are a couple of big narratives already on the horizon in the tech industry. You've got Apple coming up with presumably the iPhone 6 and some sort of wearable technology. As we talked about recently, October, uh, everyone is expecting that barring something unforeseen, the Fed is going to completely wrap up the bond buying program. Um, What's of interest to you? One one underfollowed story I think is is banking and the financial industry. Years ago, we had the crisis, the financial crisis. We had a lot of regulation that was issued since then, but the regulation was weird and then it didn't kick in immediately. It, it phased in over several years. So we're starting to see some of those provisions phase in. Is they're changing the banking landscape, but we're actually getting some of that stability now. I. I, I lost a lot of money for myself and for, for members of my service during the financial crisis because Bank of America and some of these other banks just they all plunged, and, and that was just something that, that affected us all. Uh, so I have not touched 
and I still would not touch many of those big banks. But now that we're getting more clarity on some of the regulation and we can see the landscape emerging a little bit, there's still money to be made in the financial industry. So I'm watching that. All right. Thank you for being here. Anytime, James. James Early, everyone. As always, people on the program may have interest in the stocks they talk about, and The Motley Fool may have formal recommendations for or against. So don't buy or sell stocks based solely on what you hear. That's it for this edition of Market Foolery. The show is mixed by Ann Henry. I'm Chris Hill. Thanks for listening. We'll see you tomorrow. Tomorrow.